Today on Gangster Profile, Enrico Henry the Referee Tomiello. Henry Tomiello, aka the referee, was Raymond Patriarca's trusted underboss in the 1950s. It became consigliari in the 1960s when Jerry Angiulo became New England underboss. Born in 1901, he drifted east from Detroit as a teenager and received his first collar as an adult, when at 17 he was arrested for a theft of an automobile in Rhode Island. This earned him a stay at the Rhode Island Adult Correctional Institute. He did not like prison and resolved to never go back. After his 1931 arrest for being a suspicious person in Providence, a charge which did not stick, he would go over 30 years as an active criminal without being arrested once. By the age of 27, Tom Yellow was a great mechanic or card player, a master of gin, cheating or not. Besides cards and placing wages, Henry handled stolen goods, loan shocked, and set up fraudulent diamond rackets. Tommy also also had close connections with Frank Costello, who took control of Lucky Luciano's Borgata upon his deportation to Italy. With his New York connections, Tommy Yellow was a powerful man who could have been boss himself if he really wanted the position. But Henry liked the good life too much. The drinking, the women. He said It was said by his drive at Vinnie Teresa that Tommy Yellow could handle his liquor like no one else and required almost no sleep. With his muscular arms and chest and flat stomach, he looked formidable, even though he really didn't need to be. Henry didn't want to end these behaviors and become reserved, so he let Raymond Pietriarca do that. Henry's calm demeanor played well off Raymond's volatile, violent demeanor. In 1964, Henry set up shop at the Ebb Tide Lounge on Revere Beach. Tommy Yellow earned the nickname of the referee because he saw violence only as a tool and was otherwise bad for business. He would rather settle a dispute with words instead of violence, which wasn't overly common in the Boston underworld in the 1960s. While at the Ebb Tide Lounge, Henry began to come close to future FBI informant Joe Barbosa, Barbosa took a liking to the old Tom Yellow. As Barbosa noted, Tom Yellow was the glue that held the New England Mafia together. Barbosa said, The guy is more or less public relations for Ram Patriarca. Smooth talker, the man that has a father like image, very sharp minded, a man of tremendous personality. Barbosa, who naturally hated authority, was quite taken by Tom Yellow. But unfortunately, Tom Yellow's trust in Barbosa would be misplaced, as it would be on his driver, one Vinnie Teresa who after Joe Barbosa would become the second person to join the FBI's new witness protection program. Teresa would contribute to the beginning of Tom Yellow's unraveling and the first time Raymond would ever question him. After the FBI got a tip about a burned out car in a parking lot in Roxbury that contained about $60,000 worth of stolen jade, which was covered with Tom Yellow's fingerprints, Jerry Angiulo, who was also caught up in the caper, was summoned to the office with Henry to answer to Raymond. How did the FBI find out about this? Jerry accused Henry of picking up a tail. Henry said there's no way this is possible. He hadn't been pinched in over 30 years, and his skills made it impossible to surveil him. Either way, it's gone now. Raymond shut the conversation down. When Henry left, Raymond vented to Jerry. He's handling too much. He's more active than six bosses, and he's all over the place. This will lead to trouble. Raymond, who always got along famously with Henry, and was said to never duck the man, was now starting to openly question him. And then... It happened. The imprisoned Joe Barbosa, whose friends had been systematically murdered by the Mafia, and his bail money stolen, decided his only means of revenge was by perjuring himself and landing his enemies in prison by false testimony. He spun a tale that led to the incarceration of four innocent men, well, of this particular crime anyhow, getting life in prison for a murder they did not commit. The Mafia began to panic after Joe flipped. Henry had given Joe murder contracts, and Joe had even discussed these contracts with Raymond at the office. Out on bail, Henry, in an unusual fit of rage, ranted angrily, angrily to, an, uh, to a fellow mobster. That dirty effing bum! I knew he was a weak bastard! Henry also told the associate, It's that effing scumbag Barbosa! He's been whacking all these kids in Boston on the sneak! That weak, dirty piece of garbage! He's ratting on everyone, including me! Henry was cracking up. Worse for Henry, even. Raymond in the office blamed Tommy Yellow for bringing Barbosa around. Raymond was wild. He claimed Henry hadn't been careful. If he hadn't trusted everyone, they wouldn't be in this situation. And of course, Jerry had to throw in that he wanted to whack Barbosa the whole time. Henry, on the other hand, blamed Raymond and Jerry for pushing Joe into becoming a witness. The whole family was falling in upon itself. On Tuesday, June 20th, 1967, a warrant for Henry along with three other men for first degree murder on Barbosa's word was issued. Tom Yellow was incredulous that he couldn't manipulate, couldn't manipulate federal law agents like he could local. He took to ground and was staying at a Wakefield Mass Hotel under a false name. His whereabouts were given to the FBI by none other than his former driver and soon-to-be star FBI witness, Vinnie Teresa. Tom Yellow was so trusting he never thought Teresa was informing for a minute. Tom Yellow, who of course was in the company of an attractive young female, surrendered without struggle. He told the arresting officers, 
I'm well aware of my rights by now. Originally sentenced to death for the murder of Edward Teddy Deegan, his sentence was commuted to life in prison. One of the most respected men in the entire underworld, who went over 30 years as Raymond's right hand without being arrested, would die in prison for a crime he did not commit. Also, with two of his most notable protégés becoming the first and second members of the FBI's new witness protection program, he would never be viewed again by his fellow mobsters the same way. He would spend the last 20 years of his life as a lowly prisoner. He died at the age of 84 in 1985. And there ends another tale from the gray streets of 1960s Boston gangland. If you like this story, please comment, like, and subscribe. I'll be coming back with more content very soon. Thank you and have a great day.